Good evening. Welcome. My name is Aristotle Luigius. Uh, I am a board member and member of the National Parliament Society. And I'm also the president of the National Parliament Museum, which is co-hosting this event tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, you're going to be uh, very much uh, enjoying the speaker tonight. And we will have a few words uh, said about the society and why uh, we think it's a great organization. And also a few words on the museum. So with that, I'm going to ask Art Demopoulos to come in, Art's director and program director for the National Online Society and have him say a few words about the society. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm from Washington, D.C. Planes, trains, and automobiles together today. We're all here. Pleasure. Um, the National Atlantic Society started a couple years ago. And basically the premise is that we're very afraid of the Greek heritage sort of becoming that relevant, especially in the minds of, of the next generation. There are many, many organizations out there that you all know and love. And like this organization, it's looking to the future of Hellenism, preserving our heritage. We're very concerned about the same things you, you're concerned about, uh, either on, on a community level or even in, on a familial level. A lot of the organizations that we know and love have not evolved and changed. Sometimes through business I use models. One of my old clients was a company called Pitney Bowes. Pitney Bowes is a 125-year-old company that still has evolved, changed, and, and is flourishing. And you look at so many other companies that have just gone by the wayside. Our heritage is no sort of difference and we need a new model. We don't want to be just another organization. We want to help other organizations, streamline them, bring the best talent together. And unlike what we all heard, where you know you have three Greeks and 25 opinions, what we want to do is basically call the strengths of our members, leverage them, and work on common missions and goals. Um, and, one of, and what we're doing is looking at the next generation, focusing on programs that make a difference to the next generation. Dr. Corkish, you want to talk a little bit about no, no, right. Okay, we've got several of our board members here, but uh, I'll just talk real briefly about some of the programs. One of our programs is about the, what we call the Heritage Greece program. We're helping other organizations send kids to Greece. Our friends in the Jewish American community have sent, since 99, 225,000 Jewish kids have gone to Israel for free. 225,000. And they've studied the they, they studied the, those trips, and you know, I, I can't tell you all about the benefits of them, but the incredible benefits. So we want to duplicate success. We are helping fund existing trips to Greece from other organizations like the uh, AHEPA, which has a Journey to Greece program, um, the Church that has the Ionian Village program, and we started our own, sort of mirroring the Birthright Israel program, which we call Heritage Greece. We take kids from here, kids from Greece, together for two weeks. They get free credits. They live, experience, Greece together. And we're also studying. Last year was our first trip. We sent 15 kids. In a week, we're going to send 20 more this year. And we're doing it with the American College of Greece, which is uh, Europe's largest and oldest university. And we want to increase those numbers. You know what the biggest complaint was of the kids when they came back? And these are kids. I mean, we had a kid from Alaska whose dad was a FedEx pilot, so about as Greek as, you know, what's his name? I'm a But I mean, just the biggest complaint that they had, not enough Greek language lessons. Because when you put Greek within a context and an experience, they want to know more. And the kids came back with Kokoloya and just the music and the culture, so it works. And we want to look at other sort of programs that make sense. I don't want to talk any more about you know, about all of our programs. We have another program, uh, just briefly, called My Padea. It's a social networking website for Greek Americans. I invite you to go on it. And we're looking at other sort of models. We are also, today, kicking off a regional presence to give people on a regional and local level more, more contact with what we're doing on a national level. 
and we created, I don't want to call it a chapter, but a regional sort of effort. Today we had our sort of first meeting, and we'll have these maybe on a quarterly basis with events like today to give you some benefits as members. Uh, we have a Hellenic Classic in September, uh, which is a fabulous event. It's a fun event in Scottsdale at the Venetian. Um, we've got information about it. Please, if you haven't signed up, sign up. We'll send you, we'll keep you on our email list and our newsletter list to keep you apprised of what we're doing. So with that, I want to introduce Stephanie Blahaki, the Executive Director here. I also have some of Dr. Vargas's hand I'll hand it. Okay. I'm not going to use my, everybody hear me. Uh, just like Dr. Marcus, I think I can just speak loud enough. Um, my name is Stephanie Guajas. I'm the Executive Director of the National Clinic Museum. The Nas I welcome all members of the National Clinic Society and their guests here tonight. The National Clinic Museum and the National Clinic Society share very common missions in preserving and promoting the values of our Hellenic culture. And we have been partnering, the museum has been partnering with the National Clinic Society for the last several years in a program we call the Homer Project. And that is to preserve the Greek American story through the oral history recordings of Greek Americans around the country, um, the immigrants, their children, their grandchildren, to make sure these stories stay alive for generations to come. All right. Passing out the before I introduce Dr. Marcos, who will blow your socks off and teach us all about the roots of Western civilization, I wanted to throw out a question. Does anybody have any idea how many museums total there are in this country? Total. Any of you have? 5,000? 3,700. You count up, if you count up all museums dedicated to art, history, and science, Add to that museum dedicated to barbed wire, mustard, salt, spam, and there's one on sex in uh, Manhattan, a big one. There are approximately 17,500 museums in this country. Yet, until this year, no major museum dedicated to telling the story of the Greek American experience. None. When the National Hellenic Museum opens in November at our, in our brand new building, and we have air conditioning. Sorry, it's a little warm in here. Um, we will be the only major Greek museum in this country. The only one. Um, the only museum dedicated to connecting generations, past, present, and future, to the rich heritage of our culture, our history, and our art. And we will be the newest thing in ancient history, not only preserving our culture, but celebrating it. We aspire to tell the Greek American story with a scope and flair worthy of our history and our ancestors in, the, in a state-of-the-art space that's both contemporary and timeless, with authentic artifacts and immersive and interactive experiences. The heart and anchor of this new museum is a permanent exhibit called In Search of Home. In Search of Home, the Greek journey from the myth to modern day that will sweep visitors into the majesty and enduring legacy of the Hellenic story. And will show them how their own lives are influenced by that story to this day. Naturally, our aspirations have a deadline, and ours is not a marathon, but a sprint. We need to raise $2 million before the end of the year to ensure a permanent ex exhibition that is worthy of our people's journey, and to provide our guests with an experience that they won't find anywhere else. The National Hellenic Museum is funded 100% by endowments and gifts. And I invite you all to take your place in history and in the National Hellenic Museum, the only museum dedicated to our Greek history and culture. We have here tonight in this room many board members. Aris, you met. John Cowles, Peter Parthenis, I know you're here. Jim Ligathenis, raise your hand. We're all available to talk to about helping become a founding member or a major donor of this institution. Remember, 17,500 museums in this country, four are dedicated to chocolate. I like chocolate, but we need, we need this, and we need it now. So 
remember, our rich heritage is something we want to preserve. Everyone in this room tonight is the legacy of the Greek American experience. We all are. And this museum, this national museum, you know, with it, we have the responsibility to educate others about our culture. Our rich and storied history deserves and demands nothing less. So please join us. So remember those ideals that we all preserve together, National Linux Society, Lab National Linux Museum. As part of that, one of the great benefits of, as, of membership of National Linux <coughs> Society is the annual golf classic that Art mentioned um, a moment ago. You are invited to attend this weekend, and not only do you experience a fabulous setting and wonderful food and an opportunity to network and have not with some, well, successful Greek Americans around the country, but you have an opportunity, oh, and some healthy competition. There's golf that takes place too. I don't participate in that, so I forget about it. But, but what I love about these weekends is the opportunity to learn. And the lectures that they bring are phenomenal, as you will experience tonight. Last year, we got to hear Jim Janopoulos, the head of 20th Century Fox, give us the history of Hellenism in Hollywood, which was very dynamic, very engaging. Two years ago, I had the privilege, as many had in this room, to hear Dr. Marcos speak. And he um, brings to life the roots of our civilization in a way that will really excite you and really make you feel good about your heritage. Dr. Marcos is a professor of English and a scholar, uh, the name of that scholar a resident, a scholar and resident in Robert Ray Chair in Humanities at Houston Baptist University. And I welcome you here tonight. I'm so excited to hear you speak again. If you noticed as you came into the museum tonight, the timeline, in part inspired by the presentation, the lecture I heard two years ago. So, without further ado, Dr. Marcos. Got three seats over there. Come, come, come sit. And remember, I'm from Houston, Texas, so this is cold. Okay, so I'm going to hold that much longer than anybody, I think. I'm going to take my jacket. What is America? What is Europe? What is the Western world? What is Western civilization? Right now, we are at war. Everybody's saying, this is what the West is. No, this is what it is. No, this is what it is. Most of the people that say that, what they're really saying is, this is what I want it to be. It isn't really that, but it's what I want it to be. I went to University of Michigan, right over here, my PhD. We had a whole department called American Culture. Now, I always thought American culture was an oxymoron myself, but the whole point of American culture was not to really study what America was. It's to, to do what we call revisionist history. Are you familiar with that phrase, revisionist history? You take the past and bend it to be what you want it to be for whatever political reason you have. But I want to tell you what the Western world is. What Western civilization is, is a meeting or a fusion of two great streams. One of those streams is the Judeo-Christian stream that comes out of Jerusalem. The other great stream is the Greco-Roman stream that comes out of Athens. They meet together in Rome and they form Western civilization. That is what we are. Now, what we will be 50 years from now, I'm not sure. But if we don't remember what we are, we're going to lose that past. We are a mixture of those two great streams, the Christian and the Greco-Roman. Now what that means is that the two indispensable people for Western civilization are the Greeks and the Jews. Now what do they have in common? The Greeks and the Jews, well, we, we both do the same dance, but the Greeks do it this way and the Jews do it this way, right? But we have more in common, okay? Whether it's the Casapico or the Moro, the same dance, one, two, three, kick, kick. What the Jews and Greeks have in common is this. They are, they, we're, we're picking up slowly, no, yeah. I still got jet lag. What the Jews and Greeks have in common is this. They are, I would argue, the first two ancient people groups to 
to have a real sense of themselves as a people. And not just as a people, but as a people with a mission. That they are Jews or Greeks and they have a legacy that not only holds them together as a people, but that they want to share with the rest of the world. Now, many would argue and say, well, what about Egypt? I would say no. I would say the Egyptian pharaohs had a sense of themselves, and maybe some of the Egyptian priests, but not the Egyptian people. What's unique about the Greeks and Jews in the ancient world is that the people had a sense of who they were and what their mission was. Sort of like when America had, a, had what we call manifest destiny in the 19th century. This is manifest destiny 2,500, 3,000 years ago. That's what you need. It's a people who realize that they have a hope, that they have a mission. And those two people groups discovered that mission in a very similar way. Both of them discovered their identity and their mission when they were rescued miraculously from tyranny. Right? For the Jews, that's when they came out of Egypt and came out of the pharaohs and out of slavery. And the miraculous moment would be the parting of the Red Sea. And Moses, sorry, the child Heston, put that stick up and said, take it out of my cold, dead hand, Pharaoh. Right? And part of the Red Sea. That was the miracle. And uh, yes, Abraham and Isaac were Jews, but not the way Moses and the Israelites were Jews. They don't really become the Jewish people until they suffer together in slavery and come out into the Holy Land with a sense of themselves, a sense of hope. For the Greeks, it was when the Persian Empire attacked them under Xerxes and miraculously they defeated the Persians at the Battle of Salamis and sent them back to Persia. If it wasn't for that, we would all be speaking Iranian today. Right? Um, and those two moments in the life of those two people groups gave them a sense of calling. And notice that in both cases we've got people that are coming out of what we call Eastern tyranny and dictatorship. You see, today, if I speak of the East, we immediately think of China and Japan. Back then, when you said the East, that meant what we call the Near East and the Middle East. That meant Turkey, Iraq, Iran, the Holy Land, and basically it included Egypt, even though Egypt is technically Africa. When the ancient people spoke of the East and they thought of these larger-than-life tyrants, who enslaved everybody else and lived this glamorous life, keeping everybody as a slave, the Jews and Greeks were coming out of that, asserting an understanding of the inherent dignity and value of human life, that there is a code of laws that is higher than any time. Now, obviously today we're going to talk about the Greeks. If you want to take me to the Jewish part of town, we'll do the Jewish. <laughs> but let's talk about the Greeks today. Uh, to get you kind of warmed up here to understand the difference between the East, the dictatorship, and the Greek Hellenic spirit of democracy, let me tell you a story that takes place about 550 BC. The story is told by Herodotus, and I, I see no compelling reason to doubt the truth of this story. It could be a myth. But there's no reason to doubt it. It could have happened historically. The timeline is right. It fits the people. The story is about a great Athenian named Sol. We'll hear about him a little bit later, because he is the founder, not only of Athenian democracy, but in a sense, of democracy. And during the middle of the 6th century, Solon was traveling throughout the Mediterranean world. And during his travels, he came to Lydia, to modern day Turkey. And there, he met the great Croesus of Lydia. Croesus is the true King Midas, the richest man of the ancient world. Powerful, rich, respected, his palace filled with jewels. Solon was known to be one of the seven sages of the ancient world, one of the wisest men of the Mediterranean world. And so when Croesus got to meet Solon, he immediately started to grab. He took Solon room by room and showed him his wealth and his pearls and his gold and everything. 
And after he had indulged in this conspicuous consumption, he said, Now, Solon, you are one of the wisest of men. Can you tell me who is the luckiest, who is the most blessed man you have ever known? And Solon thought for a moment, and he said, Oh, great king, the luckiest man I ever met was a man named Telus. Croesus said, Telus, I've never heard of him. You probably haven't, my lord. He was a man who lived in a Greek democracy, in a small state. He served his democracy. He saw his children and his grandchildren grow up to be great citizens of his polis, his city-state. And he died fighting for the freedom of his polis. He is the luckiest man. Now, as you can imagine, Croesus was not happy with his answer. I think he was loading the dice. I think he expected the answer to be, you, my lord. So he thought he would give this fool of Greek a second chance. He said, all right, so luck. That's the luckiest. Well, can you tell me who the second luckiest person is that you ever met? He said, well, sir, I would have to give you two people. Two brothers named Cleobus and Biton. And they were two young men who lived on a farm with their mother. And one day, their mother wanted to go into town for a very important ceremony or religious festival for the gods. And she wanted to go and worship at the temple, but her oxen were sick. And so her two faithful sons immediately hitched themselves to the ox cart and ran all the way to the city to get their mother there on time. When they got there, they were so exhausted, they fell asleep at the sort of eaves of the temple under the shadow of the statue of the goddess. And the mother was moved. She said, oh, goddess, please grant my children the greatest boon. And the boon they granted was the children never woke up. They died right there. Now, Croesus was very, very unhappy by this answer. This was impolitic. And he said, how can you call these people lucky? What about me? Am I not the luckiest man of the world? And Solon said, O king, you must look to the end. You are lucky now, but I can't say how lucky you are until I know the manner of your death. My lord, count no man lucky until he is dead. Well, Croesus wasn't very happy about this, but he was a good host. And so he allowed Solon to go free and continue on his journeys. But many years later, a new power was rising in the Middle East. The great empire of Persia under its first king, Cyrus the Great. And Cyrus told Croesus that he must surrender and turn Lydia over because he could not be stopped. Well, Croesus didn't know what to do. So he sent someone to consult the oracle of Delphi in Greece and asked the oracle what to do. The oracle said, O king, if you fight Cyrus the Great, you will destroy a great kingdom. And he thought, sounds good enough to me. And so he fought, and it was too late that he realized that the great civilization he destroyed was his own. Well, Cyrus captured Croesus put him on trial, declared him guilty, and decided that he would be burnt to death at the stake. And so they tied him to the stake, and they went to light the fire. And as they were about to light the fire, Croesus cried out, Oh, Solon, Solon, you were so right. Now, Croesus was, uh, sorry, Cyrus was a man interested in religion, and he was unaware of a god named Solon. He wanted to know who this deity was that this man was calling on in the moment of his death. And so he put the fire out, and he said, Croesus, tell me who this Solon is. And so Croesus told him the story that I just told you. And when he was finished, Cyrus not only spared his life, he made Croesus into his personal advisor to always remind him to count no man lucky. And so the Greek Solon not only taught Croesus something, but saved his life and perhaps the life of Cyrus the Great.
Now, let me tell you a little bit about Seoul. The name of my talk today is The Heirs of Athens, and I want to give you a quick tour of ancient Greek civilization and talk about the legacy of what they passed down to us and why we need, by the way, I did see that wall afterwards, uh, why we need to know the timeline and what happened and who the main people were. And I'm only going to be able to go very quickly. I gave you some notes if you want to look at later. But the story begins about 600 BC. Now, Athens is an old city. In fact, Athens did have a city during the Mycenaean Bronze Age. And Athens did actually send ships to the Trojan War. So Athens has been around a long time, but it was not one of the great city-states. As most of you know, during the Mycenaean Age, the Peloponnese, or Peloponnesos, was the center of Greek power. But in the 6th and 5th century, as the Peloponnese goes down, Athens will slowly rise to Greece. Now, interestingly, one of the things that was holding Athens back from Greece was that she was too prosperous. Athens is in a region called Attica, and Attica was a very prosperous region in terms of the crops and the rainfall and everything. And so when everything's going well and everybody's got their land, you don't have to worry too much about politics because everything's going fine. Everybody minds their own business. But what happened was, around 600 BC, there were four or five years with very little rain and a very bad crop. And what happened is, as one bad crop succeeded another, a lot of the farmers were forced to sell their land to rich landlords. And then more so and more so until finally they ended up having to sell themselves into a kind of slavery. And so what was happening around 600 BC is that Athens was getting unstable. As, as we say today, the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. More and more landlords were stealing things up. The hardy yeoman farmers, as our family fathers would have called them, uh, were getting gobbled up. And it looked like there would be a civil war. Because when things get a little bit too unbalanced, and when the poor people have nothing whatsoever to lose, that's when you have the danger of a civil war. And in the ancient world, and sometimes the modern world, when you have a civil war, it usually ends with putting a dictator in control who now makes everybody sleep. Now, to mention Israel again for a moment, the Jews didn't have to worry about this too much because God gave them a little bit of good advice. He established something called the Year of Jubilee. You ever study that? Every 50 years, the land was supposed to go back to its original owners. And the reason that this law was made was to prevent happening in Israel exactly what was happening in Athens, Greece too much of an imbalance leading to war. Well, they didn't have the year of Jubilee, so what were they going to do? The rich and wealthy people of Athens did something really, really risky. They knew about this young man named Solon, who had already shown himself to be incredibly wise and witty. And so what they did in the year 594 is they turned over complete control of Athens to Solon. In a sense, they made him a dictator. But they made him a dictator so that he could build and fix and perfect the Constitution so that Athens could get through this crisis and be healthy politically again. Very, very risky thing. But in walked Solon, and he did. He could have made himself into an Asiatic dictator entirely like Croesus. But instead, his civic duty made him, you know, basically roll up his sleeves and get down to work and fix things up. He made several reforms, and I'll go over them real quickly. Uh, first of all, Solon made extensive reforms, but he didn't make radical reforms. That's very important. Okay? The Greeks at their best understand moderation, tometro, as Aristotle. They understood you do things in moderation. You don't go crazy and change the entire structure of society. So he made changes that were extensive, but not radical. The first thing he did was he abolished the laws of Draco. I'll bet a lot of you have heard that name before. You've heard the word Draconian. There actually was an ancient Athenian lawgiver named Draco who was a tough guy. And basically, Draco had one punishment for every crime. Death. If you kill somebody, death penalty. Right? And he's like, yeah, go for it. <laughs> 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 
I like that, right? If, if, if you rob somebody's horse, death metal. You spit on the sidewalk, death metal. Right? Some of you know that according to the ancient Greeks, Draco's laws were not engraved in stone, but in blood. And basically what Solon did is a sort of punishment to fit the crime. He tried to balance the punishment to the crime and not the excessive, and not kill him. That was the first thing. The second thing he did was very important. He he basically forgave all the debts that were outstanding. Anybody that had been sold into slavery overseas, Solon actually paid to have them redeemed and brought back to Athens. Anybody, you know, it's sort of like Athens declared bankruptcy, okay? And everybody's debts were forgiven. But here's the important thing. He did not simply redistribute the land. It wasn't a kind of socialistic thing. He still, you know, tried to go back to ancestral land and all that sort of stuff, but he didn't just make everybody tried to bring justice rather than flattening out of society. Another thing he did was establish a formal class system. And back then, the class system was based not so much on wealth, liquid wealth like today, but based on ownership of land and horses and things like that. And what he did is he made up a class system and he kept most of the power in the hands of the landowners. Now that may sound undemocratic, but folks, the people that own land are the people that have the most stake in stability. That's why the best way to build democracy, well, I guess it didn't work for us, but to build lots of houses. The more homeowners you have, the more stable your democracy is. Now, I guess we made a mistake somewhere along the line a few years ago. I still haven't figured it out. But generally speaking, people that own property and own land are fully invested in democracy and fully invested in law and And that's what uh, Solon did. But he didn't want to make two amendments. And so he established a people's assembly. He was basically a jury. And he gave jury duties to the people that had less than In other words, he allowed them to make decisions of justice and right and wrong. So there was balance. He also established what we today call a bicameral system. Just like we have Congress and the Senate, just like the British have the House of Lords and the House of, of uh, Commons, he created a council of elders, the wise old man, and he created a council of the people. And he made a balance between these two groups so that it could work. And our year brought me out to speak to the Congress uh, uh, last year in Washington, D.C. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, and I asked the Congress, because you know, traditionally in our country, the idea was senators were all the aristocrats. And the congressmen were all the uh, commons. I remember they agreed to that. Um, okay, another thing that he did, very, very important, is that he expanded the citizenship of Athens. Now, you do know that we Greeks can be a little bit xenophobic. You know what xenophobic means? Fear of strangers, right? Xeni. Don't you remember my big fat Greek wedding? But he's Xeni! Xeni! He's Xeni! Okay? And traditionally, even today, Greeks do have a little bit of that xenophobic. I even remember my blessed Yaya Metaxia, my grandmother, uh, who grew up in Katsabu, uh, near Sparta. And whenever you ask my grandmother about anyone from a different village in Greece, this is always what she would do. Yaya, what do you think about them? They're good people, too. Your guy who met as well, okay? I mean, there's always that look. But what he did is amazing. He said, look, if Athens is going to grow, we need to bring in craftsmen, skilled workers from other city states. And that includes, by the way, uh, well, what today is the uh, western coast of Turkey. It was all Greek as well, all those islands and stuff. And he invited people to come to Athens and make it their city. So he expanded citizenship and allowed people in. He was not anti-immigrant. However, here's the important part. He wasn't anti-immigrant, but he was also not what people today call multiculturalism. You familiar know with that word? That basically says everything's the same, just throw them all together. No. Okay? People come to America because Western culture has preserved democracy and preserved human dignity and is made for competition and is made for equality and all those things. And so what he did, and it's very important, is he balanced bringing in foreigners with increasing civic pride. What it means to be free, particularly what it means to be a female. And one thing that our country has lost, okay, many of you, you, your parents, your grandparents, uh, came to America, 
And America, when we were at our best, we had this gift for assimilating people from around the world, from inviting them in, making them Americans, while also encouraging them to have Hellenic museums and have a, a you know, Greek school and have a Greek festivals and things like that. You know, nobody had a problem doing this, even when I was growing up. I was born in 64, so that's long ago. Nobody had a problem with being able to preserve their culture and their religion, all the things that go with it, while involving themselves in the wider American culture, which was the very reason they came and so much was very successful at bringing those things together. Well, with all of his reforms, he set Athens on a good uh, you know, uh, uh, track. He got the democracy going. And after he was all finished, Solon was a brilliant psychologist. He understood that the greatest danger to a democracy is envy. There is nothing more destructive of democracy than envying the rich, or envying the successful, or envying the powerful. And so he didn't want to be envied, and so he put himself into a 10-year exile and left. And it's during that time that he probably met Croesus. And what he told, he made the Athenians swear that for 10 years, they would not change any of the laws they made. This was pretty smart. He got himself out of the picture and allowed the laws to speak for themselves. And maybe if you want to sum up Solon in one line, he made the law supreme. Any of you learned this at the law school? The difference between Lex Rex and Rex Lex? Have you ever heard that? Lex is the Latin for law, Rex is for king. Rex Lex means the king is the law. Lex Rex means the law is the king. And in our country, the law is the king. Right? I mean, we have to remember that anybody in the military uh, when you join the military and you take your oath, you do not swear an oath to the president. He's the commander in chief. What do you swear an oath to? You know the Constitution, right? And God forbid, but if, if somehow the president was asking to do something against the Constitution, it'd be pretty tough. You're a military person. But the point is that our allegiance is to the law, and the law is something higher and above us. And so on, made the law the king. And every democracy that's been successful from the Greeks all the way down to today, including the Romans, even when they were an empire, was a respect for the law. It's, it's something above us. No man is above the law. The law is above everything. Well, things are kind of bumpy. The democracy started, but a little while later, factionalism started to go up. And out of that factionalism, a tyrant rose up named Pisistra. Now, in our modern day, the word tyrant is necessarily a negative word. You wouldn't call someone a tyrant if you like it. In ancient Greece, it wasn't necessarily a negative word. In ancient Greece, a tyrant, or tyrannos, was someone who seized power, not by legitimacy. In other words, they weren't the prince, the son of the king. They weren't, you know, they didn't make it in the normal way. They rose to power on the basis of popular support. Right? That was a tyrant. Now, once you seize control, you could be a good tyrant or you could be a bad tyrant. Now, if you want to understand a tyrant, the best example of a tyrant in American history is Huey Long. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, you saw the movie of uh, King, you know, All the King's Men. All the King's Men, they've been made recently. Um, but Huey Long was someone that took control of Louisiana by using all sorts of shenanigans, right? But once he got control of Louisiana, he basically built that state. He built the roads and schools, he built LSU, he built hospitals. Generally speaking, he did pretty well for his state. Uh, uh, now, I don't know if this is a tyrant, but I'm thinking of a certain mayor of a certain city who got a certain guy into the White House. Now, I won't tell you the name of the president, but his initials are JFK. But anyway, you can decide whether Mayor Daly uh, was a tyrant or not. But he certainly is loved by Chicago. Isn't his son control members? He was. OK, you go now. I can't keep up. I saw a great special about Chicago. And do you know what your, your, your ancestral Chicagoans did about 100 years ago? They were you know, polluting the, the river. And what was happening is all the pollution was coming up in, in the bay. And they actually found a way to change the direction of the river so that all the waste went down. 
Louis. Yeah. St. Louis, yes. This is fair. And when the St. Louis people found out that you can't do that, you can't do that. And while they were having a committee, the guy broke the thing and it went. That, that's guts. That's guts. Uh, I just rented a touch of it. I think my kids are going to want to see a touch of it. That's because you're not from Chicago. Anyway, I, I didn't bring my baseball back. Anyway, the, um, so, Pisistratus was a good time. He did take control. He was the, you know, the overall, but the amazing thing about him was that he respected the laws that Solon made, and so he preserved those laws. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes it takes a tyrant to preserve democracy. And you know, let's be just honest here, okay? There were two, there were two moments in our, in our history of America when we could have just completely fallen apart. One of them was during, during the Civil War, and the other was during the Depression. And of, of course, I love both Abraham Lincoln and I love FDR. But let's face facts, if you study the history, both of those guys ran roughshod over the Constitution. They didn't care anything. That just changed everything. Okay, now, I'm glad they did it because by, in a sense, violating the Constitution, they saved democracy. So sometimes that happens. Well, that's what happened to Athens. Pisistratus helped to establish the laws by his power and charisma. Unfortunately, as often happens with tyrants, he was a nice guy, but his kids were terrible. They're like those terrible you know, kids of diplomats that have uh, diplomatic immunity, get accidents and stuff like that, in DC, drive everybody crazy. Well, what happened was, they were so bad, the Athenians rose up in anger and threw them out and re-established democracy for good. And the man that did that was a man named Cleisthenes, and he established a whole bunch of new reforms that took what Solon did and made it work even better. He came up with an idea that was brilliant. He based it on what Solon did when he, when he voluntarily left Athens for 10 years, and he established a system called ostracism. Now, we use that word in a sort of generic sense, but if you have a specific meaning in ancient Greece, they had a system that was really what? What happened was, if there was any one man in Athens who was getting a little bit too big for his riches, right? They thought maybe this guy was too powerful, he might overthrow things. What they could do is all the citizens would go to the other arm, the marketplace, and they would take an ostraca. Now, an ostraca is a punch a broken piece of blood. That's where the word ostracism comes from. And they would write the name of the person they wanted on the ostrich. And they would throw it into this big well in the Agorot. And by the way, we uncovered wells full of these broken ostrich. Uh, and if anybody got enough votes, if they got sort of four, if you will, that person would be kicked out of Athens for 10 years. But while he was gone, his private, his property would be kept inviolable. And when he came back home, all of his property would be returned. And this was what we might call a safety valve to get rid of people that were too big for their bridges. And you know, maybe we should do this today to just to be really fair politically. Every other 10 years, for, for one 10 years, we ostracize Kennedy. The next 10 years, we ostracize Bush. Which stays fair, and we should go back to that. Okay. Anyway, so, uh, he also did a bunch of things. Another thing, a lot of people don't realize this. Athens was a democracy, but they were a radical democracy. We are a democracy by election. They were a democracy by selection. In other words, you served on the council in a rotation, and you were chosen to do it, just like we're chosen today for jury. And this way, nobody got too much power. If, if you were an Athenian citizen, you could be sure that at least once or twice in your life, very great power will be given to you, and within six months, it will be taken away. And that's not a bad way to run a democracy. So people feel invested in it, but don't take control. Um, now, I think a lot of you know that, uh, what was that guy named Newt Gingrich, when he brought all these folks in, they were like, we're going to have term limits, and it didn't work because our democracy is so complicated that I guess you can't do anything in D.C. until you've been there 20 years. I don't know. It was interesting they tried to make term limits. Athenians would like that idea, but I don't know, maybe it's just less important to get our day and age. Um, now, here's part of the miracle. The Athenian democracy is reestablished in 508 BC, and it is reestablished at exactly the right time. Because at the very moment Athens is coming into her power and glory and strength, the greatest threat that Greece would ever know was rising up. Remember I told you about Cyrus the Great, 
in the middle of the 6th century, he overthrew Croesus, he overthrew the Assyrians, he overthrew the Babylonians. He was followed by a guy named Cambyses who went on to overthrow Egypt. By the time we get to 500, the Persian Empire takes in all of, again, modern day Turkey, Iran, Iran, the Middle East, and Egypt. All of it. One huge empire. Cambyses was followed by a man named Darius. Now, I said before that the western coast of Turkey has always been a hotspot for Greece and the, the Turkish people. We're always fighting. But it's a hotspot, even it's a hotspot today. And around 500 BC, one of the Greek colonies called Miletus, it has been over to the western coast of Turkey, but it's one of the oldest Greek cities. They revolted against Darius, which was a stupid thing to do, just no way to quit. And they called on Athens for help. Because Athens was the mother colony that established by a couple of years earlier. And Athens sent some troops and weapons. Well, Miletus lost their revolt. But Darius never forgot those upstart Athenians who was meddling in his territory. And so some of you know the story. Every night at dinner, he ordered one of his servants to say, Remember Athens, O Lord. Remember Athens. And just heard it. And it, it, this went on for 10 years until finally he was ready. And in 490 BC, he attacked Greece. He took a, a fleet of ships led by two men named Davis and Artaphernes, and they took their fleet of ships and went straight across the Aegean, and they took the island of Evi, the or Evi, long skinny island. And from there, they were going to move on and demolish Athens and make her a subject state. But the Athenians, because they were now free and were invested in their democracy and had something to fight for, they rose up in arms and they, again, miraculously, in 490, defeated the Persian army at the Battle of Marathon. Now, you know, I should have been given this speech in the fall because I don't know if any of you realize it, but this past fall was the 2500th anniversary of the Battle of Marathon. Did you do anything here? Or Everybody realized it late. Well, don't worry, we got another 10 years. Because, yeah, because, because 10 years from now we have, we have the Battle of Salamis and the Battle of, of Thermopylae, which are even bigger than the Battle of America. Um, but the Athenians showed themselves powerful. Now, interestingly, what most people know about the Battle of Marathon is the Marathon Runner. And there's actually two stories about it. His name is Phidippides. Um, Phidippides. I hope I'm not upsetting the old Greeks here. This, this pronunciation, my father never stops giving me grief. Or pronouncing, he says, stop pronouncing it like a German. <laughs> this is how they teach us. I wish we had a tape recorder back then. Anyway, but the, uh, it's the same thing with Latin and Italian. Latin and Italian, anything like Italian, pronunciation was But anyway, the, uh, actually, one of the reasons they teach it is because Greek is very difficult to teach. Because Greek, the Greeks have like seven different vowel configurations that all sound like E. But it's very difficult. Teach because they're all kind of big. so that's part of the reason they teach it. So they're all separate sounds and what are called diphthongs, which are two vowels uh, together. Very good. Oh, I'll get somebody to listen to this. Anyway, the um, so Phidippides, the real story the Herodotus tells is that Phidippides was asked by the Athenians to run to Sparta. And you know, as the crow flies is such a part of Sparta, but over the mountain. And apparently in two days he made to Sparta, which seemed incredible. And he ran all the way down there, got to the Spartans, but the Spartans are maybe the most xenophobic people of all time, okay? Spartans never left Sparta, and my uh, family is Spartan. But anyway, the, uh, and the Spartans, interestingly, were incredibly military, but they were also very, very religious and devout, and they would never fight during religious festivals. Unfortunately, they were always having a religious festival. And so they said, sorry, it's the New Moon Festival, we can't come. I'm sure if it, if it was a full moon, they called it the Full Moon Festival. But anyway, the, um, but, um, so what happened was, is they didn't go fight it. He went all the way. I said, sorry, we're on our own. And he ran all the way to Marathon. And then when they defeated the Persians in Marathon, he ran all the way back to Greece yelling, Nike, Nike, which means victory. And then he dropped in. He should always run all the way to Sparta and back, and then ran back and forth. Now, the story that really should impress me is not just the Marathon runner running 26 miles. You need to understand what happened at Marathon. When the Athenians defeated the Persians, the Persians went to their ships and went around to attack Athens from the sea by way of the Brits. And Miltiades, who was the head of the Athenian 
Indian army knew that the only way to save them is this. After fighting this long battle, fight, uh, Miltiades took his army and did a forced march. And they marched so quickly as an army to Athens that they got to Athens before the Persian ships got there. And so when the Persian ships got there, they saw all the Athenian soldiers waiting for them. Unbelievable. And they said, we're going home. They turned around and left. Now, Darius would have attacked again, but you know, he, he was running an empire. He got distracted. Something wagged the dog. I don't know. He got distracted, okay? And he was never able to attack again. He then died and was followed by Xerxes. Xerxes decided he would destroy the Greeks, but he wasn't able to do it until 480. So there's 10 years between the first of the Persian Wars and the second of the Persian Wars. And we, we talk of them as if they're one war. And folks, I study history as well as English, and I'm convinced that 200 years from now, when we look back at the 20th century, we will talk about World War I and World War II as if it were the same war. I really think we will. I mean, the Hundred Year War was actually a whole series of wars between France and, and, and England. And I think we will eventually. It's, it's a war against German aggression, whether it's World War I or World War II. And in a sense, 490 BC is the World War I of ancient Greece, and 480 BC is the World War II. Now, the typical Greek thing to do after 490 is to say, we beat them. Let's go back to having fun. Thankfully, in, after 490, in the middle of the 480s, a new leader rose up in Athens, a great man named Themistocles. And Themistocles is perhaps the Winston Churchill of the ancient world. Because Themistocles was the one who really saved the West. If he didn't rise up when he did, Persia probably would have defeated. Greece. Now, Themistocles is, was not really an aristocrat. He was more, he wasn't exactly a commoner, but he was not from the high family, and in a regular society, he never would have seized control. It was only, kind of like when we talked about um, uh, Lincoln as a dark horse candidate, or growing up in the law cabinet, that's kind of what Themistocles was, he was a man of the people. And only in a democracy like Athens would he have had the ability and chance to rise up. And he was one of these people, uh, he, he was famous for saying, I may not know how to play the lyre or sing, but I may have to So he was kind of a, you know, a tough go-get. He, uh, he was kind of like Brett Butler, okay? He was not like Ashley Wilkes. He was not an aristocratic, polished kind of guy. He was like Clark Gable, and he was daring and rash and didn't mind <laughs> bending the rules when he had to. But he was the man for the moment, just like Mr. Churchill. And what he did that saved Greece is about 486 or so, the Athenians had a silver mine that had a big load. And all of this money rushed into the Athenian coffers. And everybody wanted to just give the money away as a windfall. But Themistically said, no, we're going to take that money and we're going to build a fleet. Because the Persians are going to come back. You don't think we stopped this and ended it one battle. And thank God he was able to have the political will to build it. Because when 480 came, the Athenians were ready. It would not have been otherwise. Themistocles also spent time gathering together the squabbling Greek city-states to get them to work together. Athens, you know, Sparta, and Thebes, and all the other ones. And he was doing diplomatic relations, trying to get the Greeks to work together, because he knew that you know, what was it? We'll, we'll either uh, divide we stand. Uh, I'm sorry, together we stand, divided we fall. We'll fall apart if we're not together because we the, the Persians are too strong. Well, most of you know the story. Xerxes was unlike Darius. Xerxes was a wild man. He's the one that almost destroyed the Jewish people. If you read the Book of Esther, okay? He was a wild man. In fact, he was considered by the ancient Greeks to be the very epitome of hubris or pride. Because do you know what he did? You all know what the hell spot is? Today it was the Dardanelles. It's the Straits where Turkey comes up to Thrace up there. He actually bridged the hell spot. With a, what we call a pontoon bridge using boats. He bridged the hell spot. And by doing that, he's actually bridging Asia and Europe. And to make it worse, he went to Mount Athos. Anybody been to Mount Athos? And then he leaves Athos and he kills it. Um, there was a little out. Cowards. Mount Athos. Uh, he actually built a canal through Mount Athos. So in other words, he turned the land into, into, into he turned the sea into land, and the land into sea. That was considered the ultimate act of humans. But he was a wild man, but stop. He, what he did is, he marched 
maybe as much as a billion people up from Thrace and Macedonia and down into Greece, while sending a fleet to follow them and track them all the way up and down. Now, just quickly, the two basic, the two biggest battles were Thermopylae and Salamis. Now, once again, the Spartans were resisting. They didn't want to join this group. And here's what the Spartans said. We think that we should fortify Corinth, the Isthmus of Corinth. Isn't that nice of them? We'll let all of Greece probably fall. And of course, anybody can tell you, once the Persians have got to the Isthmus of Corinth, they're going to take everything. Can't wait that long. Luckily, the Spartans had an interesting system where they had two different kings. And one of those two kings was a young man with his eyes fixed on glory. Leonidas, that's how you pronounce it. Leonidas, you've seen 300. Um, how many of you saw that rather disturbing film, 300? Your grandkids probably made you watch it. You said, why did you make me watch this? Um, I was just talking about this the other day with somebody. And when they made that movie, it was based on a comic. You know, it's actually based on a comic. That's why it's so insane. Uh, and the way they present Xerxes, like, like he's an animal. And I remember on the news that the Iranians government was complaining to America. They said, you know, why are you depicting like this? And I remember saying to myself, those Iranians are really very foolish. What they should have done is just kept their mouths shut. Because probably only 1% of Americans know that Persia is Iran. Right? If they just shut up, nobody would have known. But they had to go open up their mouth. But anyway. um, so they came down there. Now, Leonidas knew that the mystery piece was right. By the way, you do know that there's an older version of the movie called 300 Spartans. That is actually quite good. It's got a kind of a silly romance mixed in. Basically, it's dignified, it's done well. Sir Ralph Richardson uh, plays um, Themistocles very well, and uh, the loudiness is really, it's worth watching. Watch out with the kids, because that's got the heroism without the craziness. Anyway, um, so uh, loudiness said, we are going to go to Thermopylae. Now, if you're going to take a tour of Greece, don't waste your time going to Thermopylae, because it doesn't mean anything. Right? Because in that time, Thermopylae was right on the shore. On one side was the water, on the other side was the mountains. Today, because of siltation, Thermopylae is way over here. So you look at it and say, why didn't the Persians just go like this? Well, it wasn't there. Right? Uh, Ephesus was also right at the port uh, of the Mediterranean back then, too, if it's far away. Um, so back then, Thermopylae is kind of like the Khyber Pass. If you've heard of that, that takes you to Pakistan and into India. It was the only defensible point that the Persians had to go through to get down into Greece. And so Lonivas took his, uh, his personal bodyguard, 300 men, there were others, and they did get some help, by the way, uh, from the Thebans and a few other people up there, so it wasn't just as far as them. They were the, the basis of it, and they held the pass against the Persians. And now that I live in Houston, Texas, you all know that the Alamo is the Thermopylae of Americans. Very similar. The reason that the Alamo is the same as Thermopylae is it is a great battle where the people lost and all died, but in losing, they secured the winning of the war. They slowed down the enemy, they gave our forces time to get together, in our case, so that we could we uh, I'm not a Texan good morning, uh, so that we could, you know, when I when I moved down to Texas, I called it the Civil War. Now I call it the war between the states. I mean under five years we called it the war of northern aggression. So they're making, they're making a, they're making a southern. I really love Texas. Um, they have pride. That's what I like about. I like you Chicago and see you have pride. Um, and uh, of course, it was the Battle of San Jacinto that really was. The, that's what they really defeated Santa Ana. But the Alamo slowed him down and gave uh, 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 Houston, Sam Houston, time to recruit. Well, some of the stories quickly from Thermopylae that you know that are so wonderful is that while the, uh, the Spartans were at Thermopylae and the Persians were perched farther away. Xerxes sent a spy to go in and look at the Spartans to see what the enemy looked like. And when the spy came in, what did he see the Spartan men doing? They were all combing their hair with oil. And he said, oh, they're a bunch of sissy boys, and ran back and laughed to Xerxes. But Xerxes had some Greeks in his army that were traitors. And the Greek told him, no, Lord, the reason they are oiling their skin and their hair is because they're preparing their bodies for death. Right? Now, the most you can do, it's actually, actually, again, it's just like the Alamo. You know that there were two charges at the Alamo, but the 
Texas were able to hold the Texans, were able to hold Santa Ana, right? Until finally, the same thing. Two times, uh, Xerxes tried to get a human sent his immortals in, and they could not get past the Spartans. But there was a traitor that I did at the Alpes. He showed the, the Persians a way up this old goat herd path so that they could surround the Spartans. And now they were surrounded, and they came in from both sides. Leonidas sent all the other soldiers away and only stayed there with his men. And as they started to kill them, uh, uh, a voice from the Persians cried out to the Spartans, you must surrender or our arrows will block out the sun. To which the Spartans responded, how pleasant. If your arrows block out the sun, then we shall fight the sheep. That's the key. That's a Greek sportsman. Okay. I don't want to mention that guy anymore. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Okay. Um, so, that was the moment. But again, that in and of itself did not stop the Persians. It slowed them down, and it gave Themistocles time to do his stuff. Themistocles did something amazing. People don't realize what he did. He sent someone to the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle of Delphi said, Oh, Athens, think of divine sadness and trust to your wooden walls. Now, nobody knew what this meant. Trust to your wooden walls. Most of the Athenians said, oh, he means our old wooden walls around the city. And Themistocles said, no, he knows. The man knows here. The wooden walls are our ships. And what Themistocles did, again, another moment of unbelievable political will. He got the Athenians to <laughs> abandon Athens. Because he knew they could not hold Athens. He got them to abandon Athens and to go to Samos, which is a which is along the water, there's a tiny little island, and it's a sort of little juggernaut. And it's the only place they could win, was in a sense, it's like a watery version of the model. It's a place where the Greeks, a small navy, can hold off a big one. So he moved everybody down there. And, and by the way, the Persians did come in and leveled Athens to the ground. Um, and Themistocles, to show you, these are the kind of politicians that we love. He took one of his servants and sent them to Xerxes. And he told the servant to tell Xerxes, I, Themistocles of Athens, know, O Lord, that you are destined to take the whole Mediterranean. And so to show you that I am loyal, I am going to get all the Athenian navy bottled up at this place called Salus, so you can come over here and destroy us. And that's how he lured him into the trap. But it wasn't just trap. Themistocles was smart. He knew this was the only way to beat him. And if we beat him, that's great. But if he beats us, then I can tell him, I was on your side. And later on, when the Athenians threw him out the same way they threw out Churchill after World War II, he went to Persia and was taken in by Xerxes. So he is the ultimate example of a political survivor. So at the Battle of Salamis, a, a small Athenian a fleet of 200 ships defeated a fleet of about 1,000 ships and sent the, the uh, Persians packing back to Persia. And that, starting in 480 and 479, is the beginning of the golden age of Athens, and it lasts through most of the 5th century BC. And this is really the birthplace of democracy and the birthplace of Western civilization. This is the place where Heracles, perhaps the greatest statesman in Western history, rose up and showed people how to orchestrate a democracy and get the will of the people to work together to make a strong place. It was the time of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, the three great tragedians who in a sense almost invented tragedy. These were the people that, that gave us a view of man and of the gods, struggling between predestination and free will, struggling between fate, trying to understand, uh, 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 you know, how things work for families and the difference between loyalty to family and loyalty to the state, the difference between piety and duty, all of these issues that are so essential to, to the operation of democracy were wrestled out in the theater of Dionysus where these plays were presented. Now, do we have anybody here from California? Did, did you get to see when they presented the Trojan women? Last year, I don't know, I know, some, I know George Marcos and some of the others were there. Uh, but there is a Greek acting troupe. This guy's name is uh, Melinas Loitidis. And he's been coming over to America and putting on Greek tragedies. And he uses a chorus and everything. 
And he presented, um, uh, first he did the Bacchae, then the Trojan women, he did it in my school. And I brought it in and I introduced everything. And then he did the Oristia. And this next year, I actually did the adaptation form of Iphigenia at Taos. So it's a tragedy by Ripley. So I'm, I'm hoping he's going to take it to California. I know he's going to Dallas and it's really in Toronto. It's going to be off Broadway. Uh, but I know that you guys sponsored the Ion, right? Yes. Uh, you need to understand that the reason why we need to preserve tragedy is not only because it's great art and great literature. You need to understand that the point of a tragedy is once again to wrestle with the ideas and struggles and issues of what it means to live in a democracy. And if you've ever seen a Greek tragedy, you will see that all of the major characters are basically aristocrats and lords and kings. But there's also this thing called the chorus. And the chorus is always made up of comedy. The old men, the captive women, the suckling women. And so what you've got in a tragedy is the aristocrats and the people, the common citizens, in a sort of struggle, a sort of agon, which is a Greek word, agon or agon, agony, is a contest or a struggle. And it's important because we need to have our debates, not just in political debates on TV, but through art and through music, not narrowly, but art that is going to make us wrestle with ideas, what it means to be human. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What is the nature of the good man? What is the nature of the good life? What is the nature of the good state? Right? Most of you are probably most familiar with the tragedy of Antigone. Remember the woman who's got to violate her uncle's rules so that she can give proper burial to one of her brothers, right? So what comes first? Your duty to your family or your duty to the poets? These are issues that are still with us and still important. And the Greeks found a way to wrestle with it and not just at the election. Do you understand how important that is? Herodotus, the father of history, some call him the father of lies, but Herodotus tells the story of the Persian War. But he doesn't just tell us the story of the Persian War. Herodotus tells us the first story about a clash of civilizations. And don't we still have a clash of civilizations right now? And by the way, don't think when you read Herodotus that his clash of the civilizations is going to show all the Greeks as perfect and all the uh, Asians as barbarians. No, he does allow us to see good and bad in both. And that's a pretty amazing couple uh, for somebody that you know was fighting against the Persians. Uh, Thucydides, not only the first historian, but the first political scientist who studied the politics of power, how things work, how economics works, how power, all of those things. They invented uh, uh, you know, the, the beginning of the, the great architecture and science and, 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 and uh, uh, lyric poetry and also, of course, philosophy. This was the heyday of civilization. But what ended that heyday of civilization? What ended it was that the Spartans and Athenians, having worked together to defeat their common enemy, eventually fell into a civil war. And so Athens and her empire fought a, basically a Cold War with Sparta and her empire. And that Cold War eventually became a hot war that we call the Peloponnesian War. And during that time, the Greeks tore each other to pieces. Heck, the Greeks fought bravely in World War II. I, I've heard statistics that say the Greeks lost more people in World War II by percentage than any other country, even more than the Russians, if you look at the percentage of their population. And then they turned around and had a civil war and killed even more people. But at least we got a good book out of the whole land. I got to meet the man that wrote the land when I was in Florida. That was a wonderful day. Um, so the Peloponnesian War brings an end to the Golden Age. What happened to the Athenians is they threw out all of their justice and they turned to what we call expedience. Ends justify the meat. They even got into a war in Syracuse, Sicily. That's almost exactly the same thing as the Vietnam War in our culture. Unbelievable. And so they threw out their ideals and just fought for survival. Well, the, the Peloponnesian War began in 431, and it ends in 404 BC. And in 404 BC, Athens is destroyed by Sparta. Between 404 and 399 BC, those five years, Athens becomes, well, I remember when I was growing up, you remember what Central America was like? You had a dictator from the right, and a dictator from the left, and back and forth, and that's what happened to Athens for five years. Radical Democrats, radical oligarchs came in, threw everybody out. It was chaotic. It all ends in 399 BC, 
the real end of the Golden Age happened. 399 BC, when the great assembly of Athens, the one established by Sola almost 200 years before, voted to put Socrates to death because he was asking too many questions. It wasn't just Socrates asking the question. Socrates asked the question, what is justice? Not what is justice today as opposed to tomorrow, but what is justice with a capital J or truth with a capital T. The Greeks asked the big questions, not just how do you survive, but what is the right way to live? What is the nature of good, of truth? I understand an hour and something about philosophy. Let me end the story. Now, some of you are thinking, now wait a minute. If everything falls apart in 399 BC, then why is the Western world so influenced by the Greeks? I mean, you realize it could have ended. And if it ended there, I wouldn't be giving the speech because nobody would remember. But what happened? Another miracle happened. Socrates was killed, but Socrates had a star pupil named Plato. And Plato had a star pupil named Aristotle. And Aristotle took together the entire Athenian Hellenic legacy and put it in all those books, actually the books were written by students, they were in the notes, uh, put it all together, gave us the Greek legacy of logic and justice and all of these things. And he passed it down to a rather unlikely fellow, a man named Alexander the Great. Have any Macedonians? No? Oh, no, 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 And again, you need to understand that this really is, again, it's a sort of miracle. It's like a, a, what is that, a 1588, the defeat of the Spanish Armada by Elizabeth I, right? That was a, sort of a miracle, too. And what happened was, is that when it all looked like it was over, because the Spartans didn't care the culture one, it was all over, and then Philip of Macedon takes control of Greece, and his son, Alexander the Great, conquers the world. Now, he was a military man, and he was tough, right? But he was also educated by Aristotle. And so when Alexander took control of the world, he spread Hellenism throughout the ancient world. That's why it didn't die, because Alexander broke not only his war horses, but he brought civilization to all the way as far as India, he brought Greek Hellenic civilization. And just so you understand, this is something confusing. When we want to talk about the 5th century BC, we use the word Hellenic. When we, talk, when we want to talk about what Alexander the Great did, we call it Hellenism or Hellenistic. Now, it, it is the same thing, but Hellenic is, is what Athens did in the other cities. Did. Hellenism or Hellenistic age was, was what Alexander took Greek ideas and made them universal, made it a universal culture that could be, you know, uh, taken in by Turks and, and Iranians and Iraqis and, and North Indians, by like Pakistanis, or the Pakistanis back then, but that area of Pakistan he went into in the time of the past. Now, a lot of you probably know that because of Alexander's conquest and because he united the world, he spread the Greek language as a universal language. Now, it eventually became not the Greek that was spoken by Athens, we call that Attic, but a simpler version that we call Koine or Kine. And Koine is the Greek word for tongue. You know, you know I mean, right now, sort of, sort of pidgin English is the common language of the world. And the reason it's the common language is because it's the language of trade. And Aristotle made Greek the language of trade, the language of exchange of ideas, the language, you know, even now you know that even though we might be slipping a little bit, all of, the, all of the oil and everything is traded in dollars, right? Isn't that interesting? Even though China is so powerful and the EU is powerful, it's all traded in dollars. Right? That's the same idea with Greece. That was the language of trade that spread throughout. Now, Alexander, before he died, laid the foundations for a great city called Alexandria. Actually, he laid the foundation for about 12 Alexandria. But the great one is in the northern part of Egypt. He never built it. After he died, his great general Ptolemy built Alexandria and made it the new Athens. Alexandria, Egypt, became the savior and disseminator of Greek culture. And by the way, by the time of Jesus, about two-fifths of Alexandria was Jewish. Now, what happened in Alexandria was very important. Let me know this. About 200, 250 BC, the Old Testament, was translated from Hebrew into Greek. Now we call that translation the Septuagint, which is the Greek word for seven. 
because according to legend, 70 scholars went into 70 different rooms and translated the Old Testament. And when they came together, it was the exact same translation. Now well, I do think that's a bit. Uh, but you do know the Orthodox, in the Orthodox Church, the Septuagint is considered inspired as well. It's considered the inspired uh, word. And it's abbreviated, if you've ever read a study Bible, by the letters LXX. Why? LXX in Roman numerals is seven. So LXX is the Septuagint. And that is the Bible that Jesus used. That's the Bible that St. Paul used. That was the Bible that all the Hellenized Jews used. And I'm going to tell you this, because I don't know if, uh, if there are any of you here that, like me, are always studying your Bible, and always reading your notes and studying things like that. But you may have noticed this if you really study the Bible carefully. You know, in the New Testament, Paul is always doing something like this. Jesus did this, and thus was fulfilled this. And he quotes the Old Testament, right? He does that a lot. Now, if any of you are kind of savvy, have you ever read that and then looked it up in the Old Testament to see? Because if you ever did that, you'll notice that sometimes when you look up the actual verse in the Old Testament, it's a little bit different. Now, that's not because of some conspiracy theory. Okay? The reason is because when Paul quoted the Old Testament, he was quoting the Septuagint. He was not quoting the Hebrew, which they would call the Masoretic text. He was quoting the Greek. But today, when we translate Bibles into English, we translate directly from the Masoretic Hebrew text, not the Septuagint. So when you're reading the Old Testament itself, you're reading something translated from Hebrew straight into English. But when you read it in Paul's letters, you're reading something that's Hebrew, translated to Greek, and then translated to English. That's the reason. Okay? And by the way, in our modern arrogance, we just take for granted that we understand Hebrew better than the Alexandrian scholars back then. Now that might be true, but I'm not going to take that for granted. They very well might have known Hebrew better than we do. Who are we to think that we know better than they do? But I mean, we tend to think we know better than they do. Uh, can I have time to but it's the next question. So, so anyway, so that, that's how it ends. Okay, that's how Hellenism is spread. The Roman Empire makes Hellenism its culture. Okay, the culture of the Roman Empire was Greek, and you all know that even though the Roman Empire fell in 500, the Roman Empire didn't fall. Did it? What happened? It moved east to Byzantium, and the Byzantine Empire lasted for another thousand years until it fell to the Ottoman Turks. Until this happened, right here. See what's weird? The War of Greek Independence in the early 19th century sparked Hellenism again. And all of my favorite poets, Byron, Shelley, and Keats, I teach the Romantics, they were all inspired by the Hellenistic revival of this. Right. Okay. And so that is the very long story, actually very brief, but the long story of how Hellenism begins with this guy named Solomon and is carried all the way down to us today. And it is a legacy that we can lose if we don't hold on to it. It's not going to preserve itself. It's just going to. It's not going to. I mean, you, I mean you, you don't think that the Lithuanians are going to preserve our culture. Or the Italians, or the Jews. We have to preserve it, or it's not going to be preserved. And what's wonderful is, by preserving our culture, we're preserving the culture of the world. I can't think of anything more important for us to do, for us, you know, sons and grandsons and great grandsons and immigrants. That's what we need. I'm going to stop there. Thank you all. I just want to ask you, what's going on in the Middle East today? How do you put that in the context of the canyon? Is it so Within the prism of history. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this spring that you're talking about. It just, I mean, it, it's, it's it, the, the history just goes on and on and on. I really do think it goes back to a lot of this idea of the clash of civilizations. We need to, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but I mean, you know, okay, I, I, I was really hopeful maybe we could build a democracy in Iraq, but it's very difficult. See, the trouble is that we take from, you know, look, I'm very much an American and stuff like that, and, 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 and I'm actually fairly conservative, and I'd love to think that Iraq could be uh, a democracy, but we sometimes have this idea in America that voting is magic. You see what I mean? We have this idea that if all the people in the country get their finger painted black and vote, then suddenly they're a democracy. And it just doesn't work like that. 
democracies need not only political and economic infrastructures, democracies need cultural infrastructures. You, you can't have a democracy if you have an understanding of the inherent dignity of every human being. And I mean, there were sometimes, I mean, there were a, a few flowers of, of a Muslim culture, like in Toledo and Spain and places like that. Uh, but you can't just, I, I wish we could, but you can't just impose democracy upon people. You have to know what freedom is, or you're just going to abuse it. Right? That's why, you know, a, a, a lot of people, you know, I've talked about these two great streams. A lot of people fight today about, you know, our founding fathers, right? Is America a sort of secular enlightenment thing, or is it a Judeo-Christian thing? Well, the real answer is that it's both, okay? I mean, the, the basic system they came up with goes back to Locke and people like that, and it is fairly secular. But the only reason democracy works is because we're a Judeo-Christian and that means that we're a morally self grateful Until you have a group of people that can morally self-regulate themselves, they're not going to go wild every five seconds. Until you have people that have, and maybe we call it a pure Protestant worker, what are you going to call it? Until you have a people that can respect democracy and understand what freedom means and not abuse it, the system's going to fall apart. And so, I mean, you know, what I'm saying is you can't just impose a democracy plan. It has to be built from the ground up. And I was just talking, the, the, the taxi cab driver brought me over here was from Jordan. And I explained to him the difference between the British Empire and the American Empire, what I called that. The real difference between the two is this. Yeah, this is what we talk about. This, I talk very slow because he didn't know much English, but it was fun. In fact, Art, you probably thought I was acting like cheating like a, like a child. He wanted to give you a free camera. Right? I, I, is that what he said? I thought that's what he said. I wasn't sure. But for the next five minutes, I kept saying to Art, I'm so glad I'm here. I, I, I wasn't feeling like this. I was just talking slow. I was in that mode. I can actually talk slow. I can't think I did it, but I can do it. Um, but anyway, what I was sharing with him, if you study history, you know this, that the difference between the British Empire and our empire is this. The British Empire worked not just because they had political and economic power, but because the British had something called the British Civil Service. If you were an aristocratic British person, your second or third son would go to India and learn the language sometimes and live there and work with the people and teach them how to run. That is not going to happen with America. I'm sorry, but you're all good people here. But none of you want to send your grandkids to Iraq. You want them to be doctors, lawyers, businessmen, all that sort of stuff, right? You don't want to send them over there. And the reason the British Empire worked is because, and you know, the funny thing is that the very Indian, the all Indian Congress led by Gandhi and Nehru that overthrew England and established the Indian democracy was built by the British themselves, okay? They established that all India comes. They try to, and I, I don't know, I love the I think that eventually India would have had a free. By the way, I also told the cab driver that the, I love the British. The funny thing about the British is that they have been far more cruel to the Irish than the Indians. I hate to say that, but they've treated the Indians and the Chinese far better than they treated the Irish who are right next door to them. It's a very strange thing. Maybe that's how we treat our neighbors. Um, but coming back to my point, my point is, the reason why democracy works is because these ideas that go back to the Bible and that go back to Plato and Aristotle and that were spread by Alexander the Great and then spread by the Roman Empire and then spread by the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church is the place where the Judeo-Christian and the Greek Bible is also because they're organized with their own name. Okay? Uh, and, but remember, the Byzantine Empire was wonderful, guys, but they were barricaded by the Muslims for 500 years. I mean. The Byzantine Empire lasted for a thousand years, but for the last half of that, they were basically boxed in and couldn't do too much. Um, kill a few Bulgarians, I suppose. Uh, but they, they were really mean to the Bulgarians. But anyway, um, but you know, they, they couldn't influence. But what happened at Rome was the pictures, Augustine basically, that knit them together. And again, the only reason democracy works is because we have a legacy that teaches us that the law is supreme that every individual has inherent dignity. Even, even, even though America had slavery, which is insane, it always was an anathema. It was something that never fit in with what we said we believed in. That's not always the case in the Eastern world. 
courts, right, where there's not an understanding of the individual, the rights of the individual, of free, and so on. We have got to be, that's why the most important thing America does is the voice of America. That's almost more important than our weapons, is bringing in ideas. Uh, two of the people that I, that I email and correspond with are two Iranian students, one boy and one girl, that are English majors. And I keep emailing them because that, those are the people that are going to change things. If you've got educated kids who understand what freedom means, then you can go. A lot of people misunderstand. Okay. God gave the Ten Commandments to the Jews after they came out of Egypt, right? And a lot of modern people think, oh, the Ten Commandments, God is enslaving them. But you need to understand that it was through the Ten Commandments that God turned a group of former slaves into freedom. If the Jews didn't have the law, they would have just put another dictator over them, like the Russians did, and like the Iraqis will probably do as well. They'll just put another dictator, because they don't know what it means to be free and what it means to morally suffer. So that's why our, that's why the culture is as important as the economics and the politics and the military. Because if you don't have the foundation of freedom, then you don't have anything to build on. And it will eventually explode. I wish I could be more optimistic with that. We all often have discussions about what's covered in pain. And how do you define gold? More specifically, define I mean, in this sense, you know, we ask Greeks. Yeah, they're right. I mean, we're talking Greeks. about building a museum. We're yeah. talking about the society and letting society preserve a culture. What is that culture? I mean, you're right. the politics of that culture? I mean, you're right. There are different things, too. I mean, our culture is what tells us how to value things. What is the most important? What is the second most important? What is the third most important? Our culture tells us when we cry, and when we laugh, and what is the basis of our dignity, and how we know if we're successful, and how we run our family, and how we run our children. So it really is two things. It's ideas, it's, it's um, presuppositions, it's, it's the very core idea of who we are as human beings. But it's also the rituals. And it's the rituals, the women probably know this better than the men, it's the rituals that give life meanings. It's the marriages. It's the baptism. It's the funerals. It's the Greek uh, dance you know, routines and things like that. It's the food. Because these rituals are what bring us together in our shared humanity. Is language a part of it? I think it is. I, I think it is. I mean, I know that's kind of hard. I mean, in a sense, we have to. I, mean, I think you probably are familiar with the four. I didn't make this formula up. Formula usually works this way. My grandparents come from Greece. Okay? My parents were the first people to be born in Greece. The first people to be born in America, I'm sorry. They tend to retain both the language and the culture. The next generation, which is me, tends to retain the culture but lose the language. And then the next one tends to lose everything unless we hold on to it. I know a little bit of Greek. If you talk to me, I can understand. Uh, like down in, down in Mexico, down, down in Texas, we call it Spanglish. You have Spanish and have English. I can talk a little bit of Greek if you're talking to me. And I wasn't fluent in Greek when I was five. I um, but, the, uh, but yes, I mean, it, it would be good to teach. I don't know what you teach. So the only trouble is that it's great to teach the kids the, the language, but so often they just resent it and it gets angry and they just, you know, and, and it bothers me too as a Christian because sometimes. With, with Greeks, we don't know whether we're preserving our language or our faith, and I, I need to mix those two up. Um, I think it's more important to teach them the culture and to teach them the vocabulary that comes with that culture. At least if they can learn the roots of words. If they know that demos means people and krasi means rule or power, and to understand that democracy means rule by the people, then they will understand the interface between culture, because I, I just, I think we're fighting for losing that. I mean, I, I'm very happy with what you said. They wanted to learn more language, so we can do it. Has anybody seen it work? Uh, well, let me finish this question. Does anybody want to comment on that? Because I think it's important. Before we yeah, I mean, I, t I took um, Latin for four years, and it was extremely useful to me. And um, I learned all my English grammar from Latin. I'm a physician who was very helpful in med school to help the period. And I think Greek is the exact same thing. And Greek and Latin are basically the same thing. So, you know, I've always, I've always thought that um, 
that there's a real argument to be made from learning Greek just for their reason, just like just like that. First, you have to decide whether to learn modern Greek or ancient. More point. Yeah, but they're 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 they're, they're closer. They're, closer. they're much yeah. closer. It, the people that said that they're very different are the non-Greeks who want to distance the modern oh, culture right. from the old culture. But they but the the concept of the modern Greek is like the same. Thing. Sure, the Greek grammar is yeah. is exactly the same. There's just a little bit less of it in modern. Most of the vocabulary is the same. And you, and you learn an educated modern Greek, and I think you know, you're doing pretty well. I mean, I remember taking a Greek uh, a Greek school. And what I wish they, even though I'm an English professor now, it sounds crazy for me to say it, but I wish they spent more time teaching this conversational English rather than spending all that time in French. Just let us speak, you know, so we could speak with the Ayat couple. And, and I remember that was just, I mean, I was interested in grammar because I went into English. But, 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 the most important thing actually was that I was second generation. My parents emigrated, my grandparents emigrated before 1910, all four of us. So I'm second generation here. My Greek is decent, not good. And we married a nice Greek girl. So when I got two kids, what are they, third generation, we got a tutor, they're fluent. Now that's good. So and they done. love it. And I got to tell you something. So I live in Winnetka, right? Pretty, pretty waspy still. And so my, and there's a few, you know, Greek kids there. My daughter told me, like in sixth grade, she said, all oh, true story. She said, a class kids are coming up and teach me some Greek. Teach me some Greek. They think it's really cool. And then you would teach them some Greek stuff. So I, 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 I Has anybody else been able to really keep their right kids from the Greek? I mean, really? Have you been able to do it? Yeah, more people in Greek when they were young. They still feel like I mean, I was fluent. I remember they told me I was fluent. I can still understand little bits and pieces and stuff like that. Uh, but it's, it's still actually, I mean, just to add to that, to the, I don't have grandkids yet. But uh, I'm in third generation. I mean, uh, my grandparents came here. Actually, my grandmother was born here as well. And I'm only half Greek, but uh, I still got to maintain, although I don't speak the language, I still got to maintain strong ties with the culture. Just, it really revolves around the church, at least. States. Uh, there's so much, our religion is so intertwined with Greek culture. I think that's what helps us to perpetuate Greek culture, or will help us to perpetuate Greek culture through future generations. Uh, another point to bring up, I think, you have to look at is almost uh, the Jewish faith and uh, how strong uh, they are with their own culture, yet no one speaks Hebrew. So well, they use, well, they learned enough to do their, their, uh, yeah. their, 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 I mean, the best thing but it's not a conversation, it's my point. Get I mean, it's... Yeah. Wait, you want to say, well, we're going to have a ride. It's just a nice experience I have to see. We're going to have a ride. We're going to have a ride. Oh, then that's right. You know what he's saying? A barbarian in the ancient Greek world meant a non-Greek. Because meant somebody who was Greek. Right, yeah. Because, because they thought all other languages sounded like this. Bar, 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 bar. That's actually where the word barbarian comes from. But you want to see something. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, if, if really, to any Greek philosophy, when you play it over here, so you're saying we need to know Greek. Why is the Greeks, or they, they talk 100% Greek all the time, so screw up? They got the street open. Yeah, you know what? They were broke out. It's not about them, the language. Um, they probably, you know, nothing kills me more than when I talk to a Greek and I said, did you just got back from Greece? And said, oh, did, did, you, did you see my CD? Oh, I went to the nightclub. If you, if you want to go to a nightclub, stay in America. What are you talking about? What do I want to see? A bunch of old rocks. So that always kills me. And I kind of, you know, put it on. But I don't really think these it is strange. I mean, they, they seem to have lost it and we kept it. You know, and it, it, it's odd. But one second, wait. Yes, I just have to I, think I was actually born in Greece, but we had one of the animals for a generation here, so kind of funny. You were kind of born in Greece, but it's the Greek. Is it no, 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 no accent? Okay. Uh, but uh, I think it's all well and good if people were to speak Greek and teach their kids how to speak Greek. I agree with what you said. I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm in favor of it. It's like the kids are going to learn it, or at least I hope they do. But you're swimming against an overwhelming time. If you think you're going to preserve some kind of cultural meaning for what it is, to, to Greek by just, you know, the church and the language and all that. I support it, but I think, what's the dialogue? Is it about Greekness or is it about Hellenism? Right? Because the thing about Hellenism is it's not ethnic. And if you make it ethnic, you're going to lose. You're going to die. You're going to lose in a sea of, of Chineseness and Hispanicness and all the things. They're so much bigger than that. Yeah. 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 Right. Which says you don't have to be ethnic Greek. It's part of it. So that's interesting. It's a philosophy. Yeah. And that can be persuasion. 
important to dialogue on that. Then, and that's interesting, you know, and, and that's true about America, too. I mean, what, what is America? Like, for instance, you know, I'm so glad, you know, until very recently, you very rarely saw Asians give the public, the Chinese, and I'm so glad they are, because my students that to me are the most American are the Chinese and Vietnamese. And the reason I mention that is that you don't have to have white skin. First of all, Greeks are not white in that sense anymore, not lots of white. Um, that you don't have to have white skin. American values are not something that just means white people, that they're lighter. And I, you know, I guess to, to come back with what you said too, I know, you know me as a father of um, talking to my kids, I also want them to know a little bit about Greece, modern Greece, because one thing that this generation, maybe even my generation, mostly don't know about is what their ancestors suffered so they could be here. And, and that, you know, that is something I think every ethnic group has to teach their kids, you know, what the people in the homeland had to go through and give up to come here. So because you know, the one thing that to me is killing our country is a lack of gratitude. We really have become unbelievably thankless. No gratitude for what we have. Uh, and the more we teach them about those, because you're right, we're talking about two different things. It's weird because when you're Greek, we're talking about our actual culture and our blood, but we're also talking about this universal idea that passes down through Rome, through the Middle Ages, and through Europe, especially England, that comes down to us. And that's something that we have to make accessible to everyone. I don't know if you can have a museum that does that, that says, okay, here, here are the Greek rituals people love to do, but here is that part of Greek culture, because, because that's what, see, what, what Aristotle, what, what, what Alexander the Great did, that the Athenians could not do, is make it universal. The Athenians did open up the citizenship, but it was not universal. We were still in the field. Alexander found that, most of you know the story, that when he defeated Persia, he, he had this big wedding where he got all of his Greek soldiers to marry Persian wives. Now, I do need to tell you something, and I, I don't want to tease our Macedonians, but if you go on the web page these days, you will find something everywhere on the web page called the Oath of Alexander. You probably will see it in uh, where he makes this speech, okay? I, folks, I spent a year studying that thing. I am absolutely, positively convinced that that's a forgery of Macedonian nationalists because they never showed you the original. All they showed you was a modern movie. Now, the point is, though, that even though I think that oath is a forgery, I think it is mostly true to Alexander. Alexander's idea was universal in life, that we can take the Persians and invite them in to Hellenism, that we can even invite the Indians into Hellenism and make them a part of it. So, and, so is that the way we spread democracy in Iraq? I, I think it is. And isn't that a long-term commitment? I, I think that's just building a base. Yeah. It's a long-term commitment. And ultimately, we've got to go there, or we've got to be willing to open up our borders and let more of them come here so they can go back to their country. And but again, even me, I don't know that I want my kids to be living in Iraq and Iraq and stuff like that. No, and the question is, do these do these fundamentalists ever want to become like us? And that's, yeah, that's, that's yesterday, yeah, that's yesterday, that's yesterday they tortured a 13-year-old kid. 13-year-old kid. Serious. It was horrible. I mean, it, it, it does help. I mean, you know, another time, I, I, where did I go? I was flying to speak somewhere else. I can't remember where I think it was Oklahoma. I was flying, and I ended up sitting next to somebody from Lebanon, and he was a Muslim guy. We talked for a while, and he was just shocked to death to hear that Christians don't believe in sex before marriage. I, you know, and I explained to him, well, that doesn't mean we always follow the rules, but that really is what the Bible teaches too. You know, but in other words, the sad thing is that, it would, that a lot of times what they reject is something that we should be rejecting as well. You know, in other words, if they knew what we really stood for, should stand for, or did stand for, I think I think the greatest man of the 20th century, and I hope some of you know about him, is General Marshall. General Marshall is okay, he was one of the few five-star generals in the like general. He is the one that, that instituted the Marshall Plan. And he is the one who said, okay, we've defeated Germany, we've defeated Japan, so why don't we go in there and rebuild their economy and help them rebuild democracy? Isn't that amazing? Yes. And those, those are two of our best friends. That, I mean, that's the kind of thing, but bring it in there and show them, but, but if we're going to do that, we need to treat them with the same respect we treat our fellow Americans. We need to treat them as people of intrinsic value and worth. 
We need to teach them by example. And again, we need to understand that these ideas are all, and again, what's, what's so unique is that the ideas are biblical, but they're also Hellenic. Okay, they, that they cross and they come together. They're not the same thing, but they come together and they meet and they are fruitful uh, of, 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 of. The other thing we need to do too is that, you know, unfortunately in our modern world, we have been taught to look down on the whole Middle Ages as backwards and, and superstitious and whatnot. And actually, throughout a lot of the Middle Ages, a lot of the ideas of the Greco-Roman Judeo-Christian were working. Okay, well, we've just been taught to dismiss all of it because we've heard a, a, a very long story about the Crusades. And, and, uh, actually, the Spanish Inquisition is actually run so anyway, it's not the Middle Ages. Um, that we need to go back and reclaim uh, that legacy. And you know, people aren't. Look, when I give speeches like this, people are interested because they we all have to add, answer questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What is the purpose? And I don't want to have value. We all are interested in those things. And if we can you know, you know, get people to, to respect that, then I think it's possible. I mean, the American experiment is still working. After 250 years, you know, we never got to you. Yeah, we got to you. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are here because they have I mean, the organizations that they're involved with, they have a lot of passion for preserving, you know, Hellenism and a uh, great heritage. And I think from some of the stories they've shared with us today, it's pretty obvious that not only is Hellenism Brazilian, but it's quite portable. And so my question is this. Um, in light of the fact that it is portable and resilient, and the U.S. and English-speaking countries that seem to be the world currency in the example you did, do you think that the burden is on us more so than Greece to preserve Hellenism? And if so, what's the best way that you think we can do that? You know what I'd love to Let me give you an example. You know, I can be rather naive sometimes. And when people told me about the Oprah Winfrey book, I was naive enough to think that she was getting Americans from the Odyssey. In notions that they can read yet another story about victimization. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a Greek over with that could get a national dialogue of people reading Plato's Republic and discussing it? The only time that happened a little bit, remember that guy Bill Moyers? Yeah, he's got a little bit many things, I think. But uh, he's a little bit more modern. Remember when he had the country reading Genesis and discussing it? Remember that? For a while, I think maybe for 15 or 20 years. But it would be, I mean, if we could, you know, start reading groups where we read something like the Republic. I mean, you know, you've got the University of Chicago, one of the best classicist places in the world, um, and discuss it in modern terms. What does it mean? Ask those questions again to see that they are, maybe I'll, who's the guy with the radio group? Who's that one? Somebody's got a radio group? Oh, I don't know, but I think that's the next. Joint NHS and HM. Right, I mean, this is something like that. To get a national dialogue, maybe of the Greeks across states having having a discussion reading where we're reading something like this or something from Herodotus, uh, the Odyssey, the place. But the players' public is good because all the questions are asked right there. And you need to understand that, that if you haven't read Players' Republic, it's all about the question what is justice? And there's a young man there named Prosimicus, and he says, Justice is the will of the stronger. That's what justice is. And, or as we say today, might makes right. And the entire book of the Republic is Plato trying to prove that true justice is an absolute thing. It doesn't change depending on the winner is. And, and we still need that today. I think it's changing. We need to understand that there are absolute standards that we need to live up to. But I mean, I, maybe that's it. So national doubt, or something like reading the antique, that's even easier. Or a production of the antique, where a discussion brought out from something like that with Greek tragedy uh, and, and uh, maybe start with the Greeks and then engage other people. Not, not as a dead book, but as a see, here's the problem with modern academics. When we read, when modern academics read a great book like Dante or, or, or Chaucer or something like that, and I went to University of Michigan, they will ask all sorts of questions about it. Say it's Dante, they will ask, when was it written? Uh, what part of Dante's career was it written in? What influenced it? Uh, what did he do? They will ask all these questions. But you know what the one question that academics never ask? Is it true? They never ask that question. Is it true? 
And until you ask that question, your life is not going to change. Your ideas are not going to change. Your behavior is not going to change. I mean, academia should be replaced when this is done, but too often academia, we hold it at arm's length, or even worse, we stand over it in judgment because we know so much better than that. We need to be able to, to learn at the feet of the master and have a little humility and allow ourselves to, like at HP you now, we have an honors college, you know, a lot of schools have this. And my job, and, and you know, two thirds of my classes are freshmen, but I love teaching freshmen, they're 18 and they're ready to ask questions. And we spent one entire year going through, we in its entirety, the Iliad, the Odyssey, about nine Greek tragedies, Plato's Republic, Aristotle's Nicolaitan Ethics, Virgil's Athenian, Ovid's Metamorphosis, Dante's Inferno, and then I give up a big course pack with bits and pieces of Herodotus, Thucydides, Cicero, all these different people. Uh, and we wrestle with those ideas. And as Christians, also we can actually wrestle with Christian ideas too, uh, all at once and wrestle with these things. And the students are interested in this. They, they have to answer questions, right? They, 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 they do care. The only reason they don't care is because we teach them not to care. Because we don't care. You know? I mean, let me give you an example of this. This, this, this is like a remembrance, especially those of you that have young kids or grandkids. Okay? What father or mother has not complained? I can't believe my kids listen to this crap. Right? Then say that, right? Okay. This is what I say to someone that says, all my kids do is listen to rap. My question to them is, when your kids were growing up, did you ever go into the den and turn on some Mozart and listen to it with your family? Did you ever put on classical music and let your children see that you enjoyed listening to it? And not just classical music. Did you ever put on Louis Armstrong and listen to it with your kids? My kids know all Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald, but they also know classical music. You understand what I'm saying? If we do not give them the good stuff, the craft is going to go right in, because that's how culture works. And again, we as parents, and parents and grandparents, are at fault because we give them nothing to counter the medicine. We give them no good thing. My, my, my son is tired of reading all the stupid novels he has to read in high school. He wants to read the Iliad and Odyssey. He's ready. He's fully about to read this. Look, you know, this is so stupid. You know, something to him. Uh, we, that's how we build up the taste. Nobody's born with taste, OK? Nobody likes coffee the first time they drink it. I don't think it's bitter. And I don't think anybody likes beer the first time they drink it. I can't imagine that. Uh, it's kind of weird to be a beer from a store, but there are many other Texas. Um, uh, but you know, you need to develop those tastes. So, you know, like in my family, my kids grow up. You know, for a week, I've been telling them Bible stories. For another week, I've been telling them Greek mythology. And we tell them stories and raise them on these. If you want, I have on my handout or on the back of it. Web page on here. Well, you can just Google me and find me. But if you email me, I have written a trilogy of children's novels called the Greek Trilogy, and the first one's called the Dreaming Story. And in it, my children become part of Greek mythology. The way I haven't found that publisher for you, but I've also related. The way it begins, the first sentence of the novel is, Daddy was in a coma. Okay? I have put myself in a coma. And the mother and the two kids are by the bedside, they're getting sick, and the grandparents say, look, you need to get away, you can't help your father, he's in a coma, and so they go to Greece. And while they're in Greece, they find a magic dreaming stone and a magic set of pan pipes, and it takes them back into Greek mythology, and they become part of it. And in the end, they wake their father up. Now, the meaning is that, that our legacy is asleep. The father is asleep, we've lost our legacy, and the kids have to reclaim it. The second book is called The Shadow of Troy, and they become part of the Believe in the Odyssey and help to help to save the West. And the third book is called The uh, Gates of Freedom. And while my son is helping Mel lead us to have strength enough to fight the Persians, my daughter is helping uh, uh, um, is helping Esther uh, to stand up to Xerxes and save the Jewish people. So if you're interested, email me, and I'll send you a copy of this. I promise you. Uh, to read with your kids or grandkids, which we, we need to. Like, I really did enjoy this uh, Percy Jackson series. My kids have read all, all five, five books. Uh, the movie was, I thought, was very, very magical. Uh, and, and we need to make it fun. They need to be a part 